friends, let's go ahead and take our seats. We're about to begin. Are you guys excited? I'm excited. Welcome, everybody. Welcome to the 22nd Annual Fall Conference of the DeNicola Center for Ethics and Culture. My name is Carter Steed. I'm the director. I have the great honor of being the director of the DeNicola Center. And I'm so delighted that you all joined us this evening uh, for our conference entitled, And It Was Very Good on Creation. We are thrilled to have so many friends, old and new, joining us for this year's conference, which is always the highlight of the fall semester for us here at Notre Dame. And friendship, of course, is at the core of everything we do at the Nicholas Center. It defines us, it animates us, it is everything we do and are is ultimately under the aegis of friendship in the, in the deepest sense. So for those of you who may not be familiar with our work, the Nicholas Center for Ethics and Culture was established in 1999 by a wonderful visionary man named David Solomon, who still uh, is a, a philosopher uh, here, uh, recently retired from, from Notre Dame, an emeritus professor of the philosophy department. And what we do is to, we, sh we aim to share the richness of the Catholic moral and intellectual tradition through teaching, research, public engagement in the global public square at the highest level across a range of disciplines. And we do this in four main ways. We do it through academic research and programming, of course, being in a research university, which the Fall Conference has become the centerpiece of our academic programming, along with several robust publication series with our friends, and in particular, our friend Stephen Wren, the director of the University of Notre Dame Press. We focus on student formation uh, through our Soren Fellows program. We're approaching 400 Soren Fellows at the Nicholas Center for uh, uh, Soren Fellows program from every college, every major, every dorm, lots of undergrads, but also graduate students and professional students as well. And we are the university's operative arm in its institutional commitment to building a culture of life and civilization of love, both here on campus and in the wider public square. And finally, we assist the university in its goal of hiring wonderful faculty, entry level, as well as senior faculty, who are uh, who will enhance and are committed to the university's distinctive mission. Since the center's founding, the Fall Conference has been our largest annual event. In fact, it's the largest academic event on campus at the University of Notre Dame every year. It's a truly unique and exciting gathering of scholars, students, and friends from around the world who come together every year to grapple with some of the most vital questions of ethics, culture, and public policy. This year, we have more than a thousand guests registered for this year's conference. This is a new record for us, and we're looking forward to spending time in conversation and reflection with you all in the days ahead. So we we'll get get started right away. Since there are a thousand of you, we got to get cracking. <laughs> so we're also delighted to report that we have a wonderful collaboration with Stanford University uh, this year. In particular, their Boundaries of Humanity project, under the direction of my very dear friend Bill Hurlbut, friend of more than 20 years, who was a faculty member at, at Stanford. The Boundaries of Humanity Project seek to, seeks to deepen dialogue on human place and purpose in the cosmos, particularly with respect to conceptions of human uniqueness, human enhancement, and the potential impact of advancing biotechnology on the human future. And we are very fortunate this evening to have a short film, a very brief uh, video, uh, which will set forth some of the human themes and situate us uh, and, and the work of the Boundaries Project uh, and the vital questions and the pressing questions uh, that they have uh, engaged. So please join me for a moment and, and direct your attention to the screen. As we, the third decade, the third As we enter the third decade of the third millennium since the birth of Christ, we are venturing outward into space and inward into the molecular basis of life itself. We are gaining new perspectives and powers over the natural world and opening profound questions regarding the very boundaries of humanity. 350 years ago, the French mathematician and philosopher Blaise Pascal noted that human existence is located between infinities, between the infinitely large and the infinitely small the vast realms of cosmic space, and the tiniest subatomic particles. Mysteriously brought forth from the dust of the earth, the cradle of our creation, we are embodied beings embedded within the vibrant ecology of living nature, intricately interwoven like a hand made to fit an existing glove. Body and soul, we are chemicals come to consciousness and spiritual awareness. Potent but perishable, 
precariously poised between the basic challenges of survival, disorder, disease, and death, and the imagined ideal, we are propelled forward in the quest for the fullness of life through the promise of our transformative technologies. Comprehension and control, rich in potential and possibilities, yet fraught with danger. The wise governance of these technologies is a key challenge of our age, and our collective choices will significantly alter the very future of life on Earth. What understanding of the source and significance of life, of our place and purpose, can guide us so we can say, together with St. Francis, Most High, All-Powerful, Good Lord, all praise is yours, all glory, all honor, and all blessing. The word humility shares the same Latin root as human and earth, so we should be humble within it. The great French theologian Louis Bouillet noted, Man can recover true life and preserve the cosmos only by rediscovering that a certain voluntary poverty is the condition for possessing the world in a way that will not reduce it to ashes. Pascal went on to comment, By size, the universe surrounds and swallows me up like a dot. By thought, I encompass the universe. What thought, what self-understanding can guide us into the future? That thought is the very spirit and soul of creation. That thought is love. So we're very grateful to have this opportunity to work alongside the Boundaries Project and with Dr. Hurlbut, and we thank in a very special way the John Templeton Foundation, whose support helped make this partnership possible. Now, as we spend the next few days together discussing questions of creation and the created order, we'll hear more than 140 speakers across the range of disciplines, including philosophy, medicine, theology, law, bioethics, art, literature, political science, and more. It promises to be an exciting three days. Now, a few final housekeeping notes before we hear our wonderful speaker. We're delighted, once again, to be in the beautiful McKenna Conference Center uh, across the street. You can check in at the registration desk on the second floor throughout the day. Sessions will be held both on the second floor and on the lower level, so check your conference program for those locations. We also invite you to check out the publisher book displays in room 204, uh, many of which are offering special conference discounts on volumes by many of our speakers. And now, to introduce this evening's speaker. We're honored to begin this year's fall conference with a presentation by Robert Pogue Harrison, Rosina Pierotti, Professor of French and Italian Literature Emeritus and Chair of Graduate Studies in the Italian Program at Stanford University. Harrison received his doctorate on Romance Studies from Cornell University in 1984. In 1986, he joined the faculty of Stanford University as a Dante scholar, publishing The Body of Beatrice in 1988. His work quickly expanded to concern itself broadly with the Western literary and philosophical tradition, focusing on the human place in nature and what he calls the humic foundations of human culture, ideas explored in books such as Juvenescence, A Cultural History of Our Age, Gardens, An Essay on the Human Condition, The Dominion of the Dead, and Forests, The Shadow of Civilization. He contributes regularly to the New York Review of Books, and in 2005, he began hosting a literary talk show on KZSU radio called Entitled Opinions, featuring hour-long conversations with scholars, writers, and scientists. With 274 episodes to date, he describes his show as offering, quote, the narcotic of intelligent conversation. Be warned, the bread of angels is not your ordinary snack. It may, it may set your head spinning and give you a high. He's from, he lives in California, as can you <laughs> tell. And <clears throat> please welcome uh, our wonderful friend and, 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 and colleague, Robert Pogue Harrison. Thank you all. I'd like to thank especially Carter Sneed, I, arrived last night and found a copy of his book, What It Means to Be Human in the, uh, in the hotel room. And it took me, you know, I wanted to get to sleep, but I, I read it for an hour and I, it's really a beautiful, superb book. So uh, thank you, Carter, 
And thank you to the De Nicola Center for this invitation, Bill Herbert, and to be in the presence of uh, all of you is quite an honor. Among the leading Catholic thinkers, as the conference uh, description has it, I am not a leading Catholic thinker. I am Catholic. I am a thinker. <laughs> Whether I'm a Catholic thinker, I'm not sure. I'm going to leave it to the theologians to judge that at the end of my talk today. So, my talk is called The Thin Blue Line, and it doesn't refer to the police lines, it refers to some other line that I will be getting into in my talk. So, one month after NASA's Lunar Orbiter 1 took the first photos of Earth from the moon orbit in 1966. I think it was August 23rd was the exact date. And one month later, in that same date of September 23rd, Martin Heidegger sat down with two journalists from the German magazine Der Spiegel to answer some pointed questions about his thought as well as his involvement with the Nazi regime during the 1930s. Late in the interview, which was published after his death in 1976, Heidegger decried modern technology's deracinating effects on humanity. He claimed that technology is not a tool and that humankind, quoting him, has not yet found a way to respond to the essence of technicity. That essence, as Heidegger understood it, consists in an unmastered will to master nature by rendering all things orderable, fungible, and reproducible through objectification and manipulation. Somewhat perplexed, the interviewers declared, but someone might object very naively, what must be mastered? Everything is functioning. More and more electric power companies are being built. Production is up. In highly technologized parts of the earth, people are well cared for. We are living in a state of prosperity. What really is lacking to us? A perfectly reasonable query to which Martin Heidegger responded as follows. Everything is functioning. That is precisely what is uncanny, that everything functions that the functioning propels everything more and more towards further functioning, and that technicity increasingly dislodges man and uproots him from the earth. I don't know if you were shocked, but certainly I was shocked when a short time ago, I saw the pictures of the earth taken from the moon. We do not need atomic bombs at all to uproot us. The uprooting of man is already here. All our relationships have become merely technical ones. It is no longer upon an earth that man lives today. Whereas the popular imagination at the time saw in those photos that he refers to a wondrous revelation of our mother planet and cosmic home, Heidegger saw in them stark evidence of modern technology's deterrestrialization of the human species, its increasing alienation from and loss of essential relations with the earth. I think this was the first photo actually taken and it was later put on its side in Life magazine so that you could see the earth rising from, uh, from the moon. Now, there are many elements at play in Heidegger's shock at these photos, not the least of which involves his idea of the fourfold, das Gefiert in German. The fourfold is Heidegger's word for the unitary belonging together of earth, sky, mortals, and divinities. It situates human beings on the earth and under the sky. Maybe what he found jarring is that the sky in these photos is not the sky we live under, but an abstract, non-relational, empty space. The sky of the fourfold, by contrast, contains, I'm quoting Heidegger, the vaulting path of the sun, the course of the changing moon, 
the wandering glitter of the stars, the year's seasons and their changes, the light and dusk of day, the gloom and glow of night, the clemency and inclemency of the weather, the drifting clouds and blue depths of the ether. This animate atmospheric sky remains bound to the earth. It's the dome under which mortals take their bearings, establish their dwellings, and look for tidings from their divinities. Heidegger speaks of the blue depths of the ether. Those depths appear blue to us thanks to the subtle layer of gases that surround Earth's surface, absorbing and scattering the shorter wavelengths of light all across our sky. Astronauts call it the thin blue line since that is how our atmosphere appears from space. Heidegger instead says, quote, the blue of the sky's blueness is the color of depths. Depth is a matter of perception. Perception is an outgrowth of the biosphere, which in turn is an outgrowth of the atmosphere. In that sense, one could say that depth hugs the surface of our planet, for only within and thanks to a fine blue line encircling Earth does there exist such a thing as depth in its enveloped and recessive dimensionality. It's because the 1966 photos of Earth were taken from beyond the blue depths of this dimensional space between Earth and sky that the darkness surrounding our planet appears so bleak. Interstellar darkness has no light looming in its depths. Where darkness does have depth, as it does in our sky, it harbors the presence of brightness, or what James Joyce in Finnegan's Wake calls the radium wedding of night and morning. Only in our terrestrial sky does night incubate the light of day, and the light of day contain intimations of a Cimmerian shade. I'm tempted to say that this vaporous overlay that drapes our planet like a diaphanous gauze renders our sky sacramental, making of it the visible sign of an invisible grace. While I believe that Heidegger was onto something essential when he claimed that modern technicity has an uprooting effect on us, I don't share his aversion to the 1966 photographs of Earth rising above the lunar surface. That could be because I'm seeing them more than half a century after they were taken. Unlike Heidegger, I find the photos full of depth, not the blue depth of the ether, to be sure, but the depth of historical distance that now infuses their original grainy black and white images. I'll give you a few images of what the actual original photos were before they were processed some decades later into the images that were appearing. The spirit of that decade, the 1960s, still clings to them there is something ghostly in the shades of gray that permeate the scene. The afterlife of the past, especially when it takes the form of frozen or moving images, always has a spectral quality about it. And I don't have any empirical evidence to support such a claim, but I do believe that much the way its gases in spirit our atmosphere the dimensional space between earth and sky in spirit's time. Only where time is inspirited, as it is here on earth, can the past suffuse the present and the future flow backwards into the past's afterlife. Biochemistry alone cannot account for the animating spirit of our sphere of vapors, in other words, our atmosphere, atmos in Greek, means vapor. 
The atmos in which we live is at once material and immaterial in ways that we are far from fathoming. It's not only in spirited time that belongs to the space between earth and sky, so does chronometric time that measures our lifespans as well as the light years that separate us from stars. By chronometric time, I mean the time of our clocks and calendars and our anno domini. The universe beyond our earth has no years. It may have flashed into existence 13.8 billion years ago, yet that is a strictly terrestrial measure based on the earth revolving around the sun, a star that came into being only four and a half billion years ago. To that, we must add that time becomes real only where there is perception, cognition, and mortality. The light from distant galaxies acquires an age only when it hits our biosphere and our, or our prosthetic telescopes, that is to say, only when it makes contact with beings whose lives and histories unfold within the distended and enfolded dimensions of past, present, and future. And that is why our universe today is not the universe of 200 years ago, let alone of 2,000 years ago. The universe, or totality of all that is, exists only in the conceptions we form of it in historical time. The universe truly was pre-Copernican when we conceived of it geocentrically, and space-time became relative only in the 20th century. In a century or two from now, our descendants, if there are any, will live in a very different universe than ours. All this to say that distance takes different forms, some of which are immeasurable. We can measure the years between 1966 and 2022, but not the pathos of distance that relates us to the era that brought us those first extraterrestrial photos of our home planet. So given these considerations and more to follow, I'm of two minds about the recently released images of deep space taken by the James Webb Space Telescope. I'm sure many of you have seen some of these images widely popularized uh, in the last couple of months. They no doubt mark a world historical event on a par with the lunar orbits photos of Earth. They have jolted us into a vivid awareness of the pululating cosmic setting in which our planet wanders along its path. We are dumbfounded by the crush of galaxies we now know populate our universe unto the uttermost reaches of space and time, reaches where the and between space and time no longer pertains, because in effect, these photos literally envision space-time as modern physics understands that convergence. Therein lies their awe. The farther the Webb telescope peers into space, the deeper it penetrates the abyss of time from which the light of those distant galaxies originate. Because the expansion of the universe has stretched the shorter wavelengths of visible light emitted by the earliest galaxies into elongated heat emitting infrared wavelengths, the Webb telescope is designed to detect and record light in the infrared part of the electromagnetic spectrum hence to peer deeper into space-time than the Hubble telescope, for example, which detects mostly visible light. By focusing primarily on infrared radiation, Webb is able to see through the cosmic dust and clouds that otherwise obstruct our view of faraway visible light. That is why its images appear so much more vivid and detailed than those of the Hubble telescope. Now, while I marvel at the James Webb photos as much as the next person, 
I can't help asking, to whom does the universe appear like this? We humans cannot see infrared light. Cold-blooded snakes, amphibians, and insects have infrared vision. But do they perceive such a spectacle? Do they perceive a universe at all? And what of the Webb telescope's huge orbiting mirror? Does it perceive a universe? the way it appears in those images. Not at all, far from it, in fact. Joe Pasquale, an image processor for the James Webb Space Telescope, remarks that the photos sent back to Earth by the mirror are basically black. Quoting him, each pixel in the image has over 65,000 shades of gray that it can be. So again, we are back in the spectral shades of gray out of which the brightness of our appearances and images emerge. In other words, it took a concerted effort of translation by an image processing team of men and women to convert infrared data into humanly visible colors and forms. I show you a few images here of the translation process. I can't explain them to you because I'm, it's beyond me. <laughs> but I will say that the translation process does not end there because in themselves the process photos resemble ordinary desktop screen image savers, no? You all see what that looks like. We who view them must actively translate what we see into mental ideas of clustered galaxies star nurseries, and immense reaches of space and time. Since we can only make sense of them through concepts, the images are often accompanied by little arrows and annotations indicating what actually appears or seems to appear in them. This point of white light represents a star, we're told. This curved reddish line represents a galaxy billions of light years away. This discrete dab represents a black hole and so forth. Another question raised by the photos concerns the phenomenon of depth. While they visualize what lies at the farthest reaches of the universe, the photos themselves are mostly depthless, precisely because of the ingenious way they render even the most distant cosmic objects eminently visible. Those objects, almost all of them stellar in nature, appear here as multicolored sources of light on a uniform surface. If there is depth here, it must be looked for in what does not appear, namely moons or planets or unknown environments on which forms of ensouled being may be hiding. It's the latent possibility that somewhere out there might be some inconceivable form of spirit that gives the images a fringe of mystery. We should also note, when considering the photos, just how much the modern electric age has impoverished our relation to the night sky, which, in the more populated parts of the globe, is flooded with enough artificial light as to practically eliminate the visible presence of stars altogether. One could say that the James Webb photos give us back in two-dimensional images the three-dimensional spectacle we have been so sadly deprived of in the past century or so. I mean the, the spectacle of untold stars that shined overwhelmingly all across the dome of the night sky prior to the advent of electricity. And had we but whirled enough in time, I would open a parenthesis here about how much of our cultural depression these days could be traced back to this stellar deprivation. Once properly scrutinized, the web photos will no doubt inflate our calculus of stars, galaxies, and superclusters in the observable universe. According to the best estimates, 
prior to the launch of the Webb telescope, the sun around which our planet revolves figures as one among roughly a septillion stars in the observable universe. A septillion is one trillion trillion. That's one followed by 24 zeros. Yet would it change anything if, thanks to the Webb telescope, we double or triple or even quadruple our estimate of the number of galaxies in the universe? After a certain amount of zeros, a few more or less makes no difference at all. Simply put, the universe is too big for us. Given the terrestrial scale at which we exist, we can never really belong to such a colossus. At most, we can make ourselves at home in our estrangement from it. So let's dwell a moment more on the issue of scale and briefly review what cosmology tells us about the size of our universe and where it may end, if indeed it comes to an end at all. The sources I've consulted indicate that the radius of the observable universe is around 46 billion light years. Why that number is so much greater than the age of the universe, 13.8 billion, because it doesn't seem to make much sense if the universe is 13.8 billion, can there any, be anything further away than 13.8 billion? Well, there can because of the fact of inflation or the expansion of space, which in fact exceeds the speed of light. So let me open a parenthesis here and remark that this is indeed a mind-numbing fact. In a flash, expansion can reach infinity. Simone Weil wrote, I quote her, the infinity of space and time separates us from God. Had she known about inflation, she might have associated it with the nail of the cross that she claimed affixes the soul to, quote, the very center of the universe. Quoting Bay, in a dimension that does not belong to space, that is not time, that is indeed a quite different dimension, this nail has pierced cleanly through all of creation. In this marvelous dimension, the soul, without leaving the place and the instant where the body to which it is united is situated, can cross the totality of space and time. Later in this talk, shortly, I will examine a short poem that describes such an event of infinite inner expansion. So closing this parenthesis and returning to the matter at hand, the speed of light is 186,000 miles per second. Thus a light year represents 186,000 miles multiplied by the amount of seconds in a year. There may be objects further away than 46 billion light years, yet their light will never reach us, nor will it reach the James Webb Telescope, nor any other observer or instrument anywhere in our isotropic universe. In sum, 186,000 miles times 32 million times 46 billion, whatever that number comes to in its proliferation of zeros marks not the edges of the universe, but only of what we may observe, know, or discern in it. And since galaxies do not appear to get any sparser at those far-flung observable limits, we must assume that things do not end there. One estimate, using the best data available, suggests that the greater universe is 300 billion trillion times larger than the visible one yet it could also be infinite. No one knows for sure. Where do we find ourselves? That's the question that opens one of Emerson's essay, 
experience. And he gives an answer in the next sentence. In a series of which we do not know the extremes and believe it has none. Indeed, when we consider the universe in these numerical terms I've outlined, we find ourselves in the realm of what Hegel called Schlechte Unendlichkeit, literally bad infinity, although the term I prefer is spurious infinity. I think spurious infinity is better than bad infinity. Spurious infinity extends indefinitely. It is serial, susceptible to endless addition. You can always add another number or another zero to it. Hegel comments, quote, only by giving up this empty, infinite progression can the genuine infinite itself become present to us. Much is at stake for us today, I believe, in distinguishing genuine infinity from spurious infinity. I agree with Hegel that the genuine infinite takes its measure from the finite. In Hegel's words, I quote, the finite reappears in the infinite as its other because it is only in connection with its other, the finite, that the infinite is. This may not be how Hegel intended that statement, but I would put it in these terms. The finite is not a fragment of infinity, rather infinity is a very particular declension of finitude. Question, does the genuine infinite, namely a finite infinity, actually exist, or is it merely an oceanic feeling that comes over some mortals at select times under select circumstances. Some of you may have heard of that expression of the oceanic uh, feeling made popular by Sigmund Freud in the beginning of disc civilization as discontents. It comes from a letter he actually received from someone named Romain Roland, where he speaks about the experience certain people have of this oceanic feeling of, of inclusion in the totality of the whole universe, of everything that exists. So it's a kind of mystical sense of oneness with some kind of transcendence. So does the genuine infinity exist only as a sentiment or does it actually exist as a phenomenon? Let's assume that William Blake's dictum is true, namely that when the doors of perception are cleansed, everything appears as it truly is, infinite. That still leaves us in uncertainty for what does Blake mean by everything? Does he mean the totality of all that is, or does he mean everything so perceived? In other words, does he mean this, which is the popular psychedelic kind of imagery that's associated with this famous dictum of William Blake? Or does he mean this, which is the exact quote? In other words, does he mean everything as one word, I mean the totality of every, or does he mean everything as an individual thing? If he means this latter, then the finite thing has infinite phenomenological pot potential when perception is transfigured. The question for me in the remainder of this talk is whether and how the genuine infinite exists as phenomenon. In other words, does it make an appearance in the world or, and if so, in what manner? Hegel declares, quote, the image of true infinity be bent back upon itself becomes the circle. If by circle, Hegel means a self-integrated three-dimensional spherical wholeness, then the universe of today offers no such image as it once did in the past when it was conceived of as bounded and finite with the heavenly spheres revolving in perfect concentric circles. Today, wherever we look with our naked eye or the most high powered instruments, we see not the self gathered whole of creation, but only a small part of the cosmological abyss stretching away from us into, into what? No one knows. 
Speaking for myself, I would say that our round planet hanging in the darkness of unbounded space represents the Ur phenomenon of genuine infinity. Most of us see the phenomenon only in drawings or photos, hence in two-dimensional form, while the astronauts who leave Earth's surface see it in its full-bodied rotundity. Yet either way, when perceived in its phenomenological wholeness, our blue-white, finite Earth gathers the slovenly wilderness of the universe around itself, infusing its diminutive planetary body with infinity and imbuing infinity with a radiant, finite body. Earth is not just another planetary entity in infinite space, but the whole of space ingathered and bound together in one living sphere. By living sphere, I mean, once again, the planet's gossamer, where all known life zones are contained and located. It's here, in this sphere, and nowhere else, as far as we know, that the universe makes its appearance, that it shows itself as a dome of stars and galaxies. When we view Earth from space, we are, in a sense, looking at the eye that sees the universe from within the thin membrane of sentience and perception. Charles Baudelaire once said that the eye is his words, a window onto the infinite. If we are the eyes of the world, as the Grateful Dead song has it, the Atmo biosphere is the vitreous substance of a terrestrial eye that looks out at the sun and the other stars, as the last verse of Dante's Divine Comedy has it, l'amor che muove il sole e le altre stelle. Whether Hegel was aware of it or not, the genuine infinite exists all around us. Wherever there is sentient perception, there is depth, and wherever there is depth, the finite has the potential to expand like space itself. To see how quietly and discreetly such a transfiguration can take place, let us leave behind the view of our Earth from above and descend through the thermosphere then the mesosphere, then the stratosphere, and then the troposphere to a hill some 11 kilometers from the Adriatic coast of Italy in the small town of Recanati. This was the birthplace of the poet Giacomo Leopardi, who in 1819 wrote one of the more remarkable poems in the modern canon called L'Infinito, or The Infinite. I'm going to read this poem in Italian and then read you my own translation of it. Sempre caro mi fu quest'ermo colle e questa siepe che da tanta parte dell'ultimo orizzonte il guardo esclude. Ma sedendo e mirando in terminati spazi di là da quella e sovraumani silenzi e profondissima quiete Io nel pensier mi fingo, ove per poco il cor non si spaura. E come il vento odo sormir tra queste piante, io quello infinito silenzio a questa voce vo comparando. E mi sovvien l'eterno e le morte stagioni, e la presente è viva, e il suon di lei. Così, Tra questa immensità sanega il pensier mio, e il naufragar mi è dolce in questo mare. So always dear to me was this lonely hill and this hedgerow, which from many sides bars the gaze from the utmost horizon. But sitting and looking out, Endless spaces beyond that hedge and superhuman silences and profoundest quietude, I in my mind 
forge for myself. Io nel pensier mi fingo. I mean, you could say I in my mind imagine for myself, but fingere is really to make, to kind of forge. Where the heart is all but terrified. I hate to interrupt the poem, but Blaise Pascal was brought up in uh, the little video clip that we saw at the beginning. And here I think Leopardi is referring to a famous pensée of Pascal, le silence éternel de ces espaces infinis m'effraie. The eternal silence of these infinite spaces terrifies me. So, so I in my mind forge where the heart is all but terrified. And as I hear the wind rustle through these shrubs, that infinite silence to this voice, I go on to compare. And the eternal comes to mind, and the dead seasons, and the present living one, and the sound of her. So in this immensity, my thought drowns, and shipwreck is sweet to me in this sea. Whatever action or events the poem describes takes place with hardly any commotion at all. A pure stillness reigns here. The speaker sits motionless on an enclosed, lonely hill gazing out. Nothing in the perceptual field changes aspect. Yet within the enclosure, the everyday boundaries of space and time undergo a dissolution and the land scene becomes, in the last verse, the, the site of a shipwreck at sea. How does the shipwreck come about? As hill, hedge, and shrubs get infused by the unseen beyond spaces imagined by the speaker in his thought, his pensiero, both time past and the eternal interpenetrate the present moment. This occurs as a wind moves through the plants and the poet's psyche. In fact, what takes place inside and outside become indistinguishable. The resulting immensity where the shipwreck occurs opens up not only in the speaker's mind, although there too, but in the setting as a whole. The infinite here assumes both a temporal and phenomenological density. As the action unfolds, the poem's pronouns undergo a series of shifts between here and there. This hedge becomes that hedge. The breeze in these shrubs is compared to that silence. And finally, we drown in this immensity and this sea. As the unseen depths of space and time engulf the local here and now with their recessive presence, the boundaries begin to deliquesce. Let us follow that process a little more closely. The wind in its unconstrained drifting between different domains blows through the enclosure from beyond the latter's confines. The speaker compares its sound to the infinite silence he has forged in his mind. The Italian actually uses a gerundive, vo comparando, I go, com go on comparing. As it rustles the wind through the plants, as well as the mental silence, the wind calls to mind, hence to presence, latent orders of time. The dead seasons, the eternal, and even the present season with its sounds. Yet what does it mean to recall or call to mind the present? In some ways, the whole event of infinity traced in the poem centers on the words mi sovien. Sovien shares the same root as our English word souvenir. So mi sovien means I recall, but it can also mean quite literally it comes over me. Mi souvenire, venire is to come, so it comes over me. So in the context of this poem, the latter seems more opposite. In the surge of dead seasons and the eternal within the present, the presence of the present comes over or overcomes the speaker like a wave or a flood. 
Now, I mentioned that the hillside town of Recanati is some 11 kilometers from the Adriatic coast. The speaker has no view of it from where he sits, yet the sea maintains an unseen presence in the poem, exerting a discreet pull on the landscape. Perhaps the wind even acts as its ambassador. Thus, what begins as a land poem ends as a sea poem without any change of scenery whatsoever. This tells us just how fluid the phenomenon can become when its surging presence overwhelms or comes over the perception of a finite subject. Presencing has the potential at any moment to overflow, cross over, and dissolve bounds of containment. Indeed, the poem suggests that when presence rises to the occasion, as it does in this case, it begins to undulate. The undulation of the phenomenon yields an experience of infinity that is both bounded and unbounded. We have no idea how long the experience described by the poem lasts, yet we know that its transcendence of chronometric time takes place in chronometric time. Through the mind's communion with its presence, the landscape gathers its depths around a perception that turns ecstatic. Such is the marvel of the thin blue line within whose sphere a lonely hill can draw all of creation around itself and become the site of a transfiguration. To conclude, if Heidegger was right that modern technicity is driven by an extravagant will to overcome all limits and limitation, we could say that this will shares something in common with an ever-expanding universe with no end in sight. There is no surprise in the fact that technology shares our human longing for transcendence, yet maybe the time has come to take stock of the fact that a spurious infinity cannot ever satisfy such a longing. It is not extraterrestrially, but terrestrially, that the infinite is given to us. If our longing cannot be tempered, let it seek out the infinite on our mortal planet that draws the sky down around it, inviting in the spirit that rustles through the plants and across the face of the waters. Maybe the only way to free ourselves from the compulsions that are ravaging our terrestrial habitat is through a new sacramental geocentrism, one that acknowledges that here on this third stone from the sun is the one and only home of genuine transcendence. Thank you. <laughs> okay, uh, we have microphones, and we would love to hear from you, and, and our speaker has generously agreed to engage in some conversation. So please come to the, come to the microphones and, and uh, ask a question. And uh, in the interest of time and being generous to your colleagues, let's, let's keep it as short as we can as well. First of all, tell us your name, though, and where you're from. I'm Liam Waldron. I'm from Benedictine College Great. out in Kansas. Yes, please. I'm sorry. So when you talk about the concept of genuine infinity, is that distinct from the concept of spurious infinity? Or is spurious infinity like an addition to like maybe not the measurable, but the understood idea of genuine infinity? Yeah, no, I was uh, basing myself on uh, the distinction that Hegel He's the one who uses that term spurious infinity, and he distinguishes from genuine infinity, where one is merely serial and numerical, and it actually doesn't have an end, therefore it has no finitude, as opposed to the genuine infinite, which somehow is in 
connection and relation to the finite. And therefore, if the genuine infinite uh, needs a, a limit or a border, you know, where do we find it? I showed the pictures of the earth from outer space because Hegel says, you know, the circle is like the best image that he could think of because it is at once bounded, but it's also doesn't have you know, an end. Whereas I tried to locate the genuine infinite anywhere within the atmosphere that we all live in at any given moment. Uh, not because it's always a reality, but under certain moments of privileged, transfigured perception, there is a, always a constant potential of perception and nature to, uh, as I say, undulate and, and, and be infused with the kind of um, bounded uh, infinity. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, uh, Ryan Schinkel, Authority Magazine. Um, William Shatner, who played Captain Kirk, uh, upon uh, coming back from Jeff Bezos's Blue Origin uh, uh, plane, um, having experienced space for the first time, had a bit of a counterintuitive reaction where he said, yeah, space is a harsh area, not meant for us. We're meant to be down here on the Earth, very terrestrial creatures. Um, for someone who explored space and fiction, his react personal reaction was uh, more like Wendell Berry, you know, stay home. Um, as an illustration of human reaction to the immense size and also inhospi inhospitality to humankind, what should be the proper human reaction to um, experiencing outer space, to uh, experiencing our own exploration of our own solar system? Thank you. Uh, yeah, I'm aware, I read the, the um, William Shatner remarks and he actually speaks even you know, more dramatically of, of a depression, having a depression. And this is known now as the overview effect of looking at Earth from, uh, from outside of space that uh, you get depressed because it becomes very clear that Earth is the only real game in town. And it's, a, and it's not only finite, but it's extremely fragile. And that we're doing our best to kind of screw it up, and that's that's part of the de the depression, is that we are, well, on the one hand, that we are stuck here. And if I wanted to be a cultural historian, I would say that um, there was there was a kind of high in the 50s, 60s, above all, with space exploration. There was a sense that there was going to be ever expanding frontiers. For human, uh, you know, for humankind, and that it was going into space, but somehow that came to a crashing halt. And NASA lost a lot of money, and we realized that we'll never develop the technology ever to get even to the closest star system beyond our own sun, and and that um, as a species, I think at, our, at the level of our species being a, a certain kind of demoralization set in, that we're not going anywhere for foreseeable future. So is that so bad? I'm trying, I guess my new, what I call the sacramental geocentrism is that it's not that depressing if one can liberate all that infinite expansive um, potential from within the actual experience within the thin blue line, because it's there, it's, it's, it's around us all the time. And it's, uh, there's, however, there is a pathology of wanting to, uh, of, to, to leave the Earth's orbit. And, and that, for transcendence to take that form, I think, is a mistake. First, because it's not going to lead anywhere. And second, because it's, not, it's devaluing uh, a kind of infinity that is, uh, you know, right here around us. Hi, Therese Klingel, University of Wisconsin-Madison. Um, your point on stellar deprivation as a result of light pollution really resonated with me. And I know throughout human history and poetry and in literature, the night sky has sort of served as a reminder of our connection with God. I'm curious as to if you have any thoughts on whether or not the, the deprivation of seeing the night sky 
um, has had an impact on humanity's relationship with religion at all? I have to believe it, it has had. In fact, I think it would be very, very unusual if it didn't have. Um, again, I'm going to invoke Emerson. In one of his essays, he said that, you know, if the stars appeared in the sky once every 1,000 years, who would not completely fall down on their knees and believe and say that this is, you know, the, uh, the uh, you know, the very existence of, of, of uh, that whole divine order. And the fact that we had it, you know, always as a, as a nightly, it's a nocturnal, daily nocturnal experience. Um, even that was not enough to demystify what the, the night sky has represented to all of humanity from the very beginning of all human cultures, which is that there's, uh, that there's something so much larger of which, you know, we are, it, with which we are in relation and to take all the, the stars out of our uh, daily experience of the sky, I think has to have a withering uh, effect on the religious um, uh, sentiment. Richard, Richard Stith, a retired teacher. Biology seems to tell us that all life began just once that archaic forms and fungi and human beings all had the same origin. So if life began only once on this most life-friendly planet, why would we ever expect that it could exist on another planet not even quite as nice as ours? Right. So my, in that light, why is there such fascination, not only in Hollywood and TV, because you want to dramatize everything and, and have fun. But serious people listen with their, with their radio telescopes for, for, for telegraphs from other stars. I mean, this seems to me a strange alienation. So the two questions are, is this pernicious to be imagining alien life, a way of escaping from our home, from our, our being? And if, if so, why does it occur? So the, I think that relates to the previous question about the about uh, you know the religious feeling, and we've always looked to the sky, uh, at least in, in the Western tradition, for our, our our divinity. The there's been some kind of association of tr transcendence with with the sky, and therefore those people who are always monitoring the UFO activities and telescopes, and they're they're looking for a god, and that's you know that's. Uh, the most obvious place you would want to look, given the history that has long associated the uh, you know the the divine with it in the geocentric model with the perfectly circular rotation of the spheres. I mean, Plato uh, took took the uh, uh, the heavens to be the perfect um, evidence. He, he called it you know it's the moving image of eternity. This, the celestial spheres in the Christian tradition as well. I mean, Dante's, you know, creation was that sort of perfection uh, of the God. Now, it's true that the planet on which we live is highly exceptional, and it is not true, however, that this planet is hospitable to life, not in the beginning at all. It was, in fact, very hostile to life. And if we have an atmosphere, it's thanks to the untold labors of microorganisms, cyanobacteria and all the other bacteria that slowly, slowly, you know, through metabolism, released oxygen into the air and that what we know as our life-friendly atmosphere was produced by life itself. So it's life that rendered the earth hospitable to life. Uh, fighting every inch of the way. So that also has to make the thin blue line sacramental because it's all the forces of life that have created a home for itself. That's what happened over you know, millions and millions of years. Um, and I think the sooner we come to an appreciation of that miracle, because if you 
at the Middle Ages to find a miracle as an extreme improbability, our atmosphere is an extreme improbability and therefore a miracle. I'm Godwin Adike. I I study in Rome. I I do canon law. Um, the reason I don't like actually um, talking about cosmology or science is that there are so many zeros to our existence, and uh, I, I just jump directly from uh, cosmology to anthropology. And if I get problematic with humanity, I jump to theology, and I believe in God, <laughs> and that concludes everything. Um, Hegel is interesting, and uh, uh, from him I wish to make uh, um, ask two questions. The first is on this infinite, uh, genuine infinite, uh, because I believe when I was doing philosophy, I am not an expert in science, and I must thank this particular gathering that is opening my mind to scientific themes since afternoon. Uh, so strange and okay so um, Hegel uh, talked about this um, genuine infinite and um, I know I read about him quite a lot and I love him and his closed philosophy and uh, metaphysics and all uh, but there is a, a term he used about the absolute spirit I, I have a problem <laughs> understanding and, reconcil and reconciling now that terminology of the absolute spirit which I, I tend to um, make a consonance with what you just referred to as the genuine infinite. That's one. Uh, if they are really one and the same thing in Hegel, because this is actually my first time of hearing of this genuine infinite. That's the first one. The second one is um, these zeros you scientists call about the infrared, the, are they really, is it true? Like, like we, we have these um, trillions and trillions of zeros following our the, the universe in which we live. If it's like that, I'm so little even to the air. <laughs> so on the on the question of Hegel, I, I if I understood correctly, you, the the abs the phenomenology of spirit and the the, the Hegelian philosophy of history um, is certainly not a philosophy of the thin blue line by any means, because for him it was Geist or spirit that um, was that the whole odyssey of history was the objectification of spirit into different forms of uh, institutional periods and historical periods. And it was the alienation of spirit from itself in the beginning where it becomes matter, and then it realizes through this long odyssey of history, it comes to an absolute knowledge of itself as spirit. This, you know, I'm sympathetic to, to this uh, German idealism. It's not far removed from Simon Weil, who uh, also, you know, speaks about a soul which you cannot conjugate with the material world uh, that easily, but which somehow, if it, if you penetrate the very center of that soul, it is the very center of the material universe and, and all of a sudden, you know, the infinite becomes possible. And I think that for Hegel, he goes the very long, laborious his, history, historical process by which spirit comes to know itself as spirit. On this, I, I'll move on to the second part of the question about all those zeros. It's, um, You know, one has to give credit to these scientists for making the calculations. For, they have to go through the hard labor of actually trying to measure and find an index for what is, as far as we can tell, is actually out there. So it would be, it's tempting to say that, well, all that is a kind of humanly constructed language that doesn't have a real referent out there. But I can't believe that all those galaxies don't really exist and that they're not infinitely receding and that there's no edge to what we can know. So I think it puts us, uh, I mean, I think the, all those zeros raise for us a, a serious um, existential question of where do we find ourselves? Uh, and the first response is that we are the most insignificant Thing in, in a universe, because we are on, on a tiny planet in a, in a very provincial part of one galaxy, the Milky Way, which is one among trillions. But from another point of view, it's, it's, we are actually the very center. 
of the whole story because somehow this, as far as we know, is the only place where the universe makes an appearance. Where else does the universe make an appearance? Where else is it conceived of as a universe? So I think geocentrism is the logical consequence and conclusion of what modern cosmology is telling us about, you know, the, uh, the infinite unboundedness of, of space time. We have time for one, one final question before we uh, enjoy the reception. Hello, I'm Catherine Wales. I'm a drama teacher, and I'm a big fan of uh, Terrence Malick's films, and I think maybe you are too. And I was wondering if... Are you talking about Tree of Life? Tree of Life, or The Thin Red Line. Okay. I mean, oh, so many line. options. Yeah. <laughs> I was wondering if you could talk about maybe if you have a favorite and um, why, or just anything about Malick and what you just said. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> well... I know that he translated Heidegger. Yes. He translated a book of Heidegger, which, you know, and he was a student of Stanley Cavell at Harvard, so he knows his philosophy. And, and, I, and I, when I look at his movies, I am always on the, uh, looking for, for the, um, the way in which that philosophical formation that he has is in, in permeating his films. And therefore, I find him a very thought-provoking uh, director. The... Um, the Tree of Life, I, I, I have to say that, I, I, disappointed is the wrong word. I wish that, you know, after I saw it twice, I could have sat down with him and said, look, Terrence, you know, this movie would be much better if you kind of edited this out or, you know, <laughs> only. He wanted a six hour version. Also. Oh, they, I haven't seen the six hour version. But I don't know what you thought of that sequence when he does a kind of history of the earth, you know, which um, a lot of people thought was a weak part of the poem. I thought it was quite good, actually. That. But um, what struck me the most about that film, if I can, you know, as a Dante scholar, you know, when you get to Paradiso after you've been down in Inferno and, and through Purgatory, Paradiso is like the best payoff you can possibly get for having made it to it. Because for 33 cantos, Dante keeps upping the ante and you have this sense of, of this overwhelming uh, kind of ecstasy and rapture that he has to keep upping the ante canto by canto and he, can, and he sustains it up until the, the very um, last canto 33 with the vision of God. In the tree of life, you have a, a scene of the afterlife where these people are going to Par it's, they're, they're in paradise, but they're, they're like on a beach. <laughs> and they're, they're wandering around disoriented, and they see their loved ones, and they say hi. Things like, Spo but spoiler it, alert, just in yeah. case you haven't <laughs> <laughs> And it's not only Malik, but, but the 20th century can, has, uh, it's very telling that the 20th century cannot imagine paradise in a way that's compelling. And in fact, that was Ezra Pound, you know, when he wrote his cantos, he, uh, the very last fragments of the cantos where he asked forgiveness, and he says, let those that I have, let the gods forgive what I have done, let the, those whom I love forgive what I have done. I have tried to write paradise. Let the wind speak that is paradise. And it's a confession of failure. Can a 20th century or 21st century poet or, or film director actually envision paradise? I don't think so, and I don't know what that says about us. Uh, and, and, you know, what would be our, our best image of it? And I, I would have liked Malik to deliver more in, in the conclusion of that movie. The best image of it is this conference. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, friends, this is just the beginning. Please join us in the, in the exterior area here. We've got uh, refreshments. We can continue our conversation. 
welcome again. We're so excited to have you back. See you soon.